SRAM is sort of a misleading name. The idea is you make some circuit that is stable. And it's stable because you've got things connected in such a way. So let's say our value here is a 1. That goes through the knot, becomes a 0. And then it's still a 0. Doesn't change on the wire. It goes through the knot, becomes a 1. In a lot of ways, it's similar to the delay line. But now we're talking about electrons traveling at the speed of light, at least a third of the speed of light or so in copper wires. If it changed values, so if we change, say, the value of this to a 1, that's going to need to change everything else as well. There are only two stable configurations for this, and we can use those two stable configurations to represent the two possible values of a bit. It can't, for any long period, assuming the knots work correctly, it can't get into some strange state where it doesn't represent one of those two things. You can build an SRAM with as few as four transistors for each bit. You need that loop, which I think is this. And then you need ways of actually reading and writing to it. Very little silicon needed for each bit in an SRAM. And it's very fast. It's more expensive than the other kind of memory that is the bulk of the storage in your processor, which is DRAM. The property DRAM has is it's really just a capacitor with a way to read and set the value in that capacitor. Capacitors are leaky. So if you have a capacitor, you can think of it as a big bucket, and it's leaking out electrons. So over time, its value will go away. And why it's called DRAM is that you have to keep refreshing it. In order to store the same value as it leaks out, you need to re-energize or restore the value in that capacitor to represent the right value. This is very inexpensive. We can get billions of bits in a small amount of storage. And each one of these chips is probably one gigabyte. The note says not to scale, so certainly it's not correct size. In terms of relative size of those things, what do we think the actual relative sizes would be? Why is it not to scale? If it was drawn to scale, what would it look like? So I think if it was to scale, this would be going off, you know, well, well be on the slide many, many pages deep. The scale of the capacitor compared to the scale that you need for the control parts is much, much bigger. But it's all still really small. We're talking nanometers kinds of scale here. So we think of DRAM as memory that once we turn off our machine, its state is lost. It has to be continually refreshed to keep that storage. But the reality is it's just a capacitor. So after we turn off our machine and we stop refreshing the DRAM, the values are still going to be there for a while. So here's what that looks like. This is five seconds after turning off the machine. When the machine was turned off with memory storing this image of the Mona Lisa. And five seconds later, you can still see it's certainly a very recognizable image. Some of the bits are wrong by then. Right? Some of the bits that were supposed to be a 1 have lost enough of the value in the capacitor to no longer represent the right value. Once you've waited about 30 seconds, still very recognizable. After about five minutes, there may be some traces still, but pretty hard to guess what the picture was. Why do we care about this? Yes, exactly. OK, good. So I should mention one other thing. So they don't actually have to read it quickly. What they have to do is freeze it quickly. So the way these images were created was not trying to, at 30 seconds, read everything. But once you freeze the DRAM, it takes a really long time to lose its charge. So if it's cold enough, it's losing the charge very slowly. If you didn't have the capability to freeze it, you could still extract it. But what you really want to do is if you are evil and trying to get data from someone's computer. And the main thing you're probably trying to get are keys that are stored in memory. If you can get their computer, and, and assuming they're somewhat sophisticated, they have in a lock state. So your phone, you need to enter a pin or something to unlock it. If they couldn't unlock it, they don't have a way to get your memory without extracting it from the physical phone. And then it's going to lose whatever it was storing. As long as the persistent memory is encrypted, you're OK. But the problem is, if they can get it out of your device and then freeze it, and then they can hook it up to their equipment that can unfreeze it and read what's there, the bits that were in it when it was in your machine are still there. And these pictures are from a paper that talks about doing it. And it's called these cold boot attacks, where they looked at how vulnerable keys are that are stored in memory on systems where the hard drive or any persistent storage is encrypted. The keys are still going to be stored in memory anytime they're being used. And if someone gets that device, even if it's locked, if they can extract the memory, freeze it quickly enough, 
they can probably get the keys. And one of the authors was a UVA student for going to Princeton on this. These are physical devices. I'm glad you mentioned physics as part of what makes storage complicated. Anything that we're actually storing has some physical representation of it. And the physical realities are very different from the abstractions that we think about as programmers most of the time. So in terms of the properties the DRAM gives us, what are things that we care about when we're thinking about designing a storage system? If you're buying memory, what properties in the memory would you like to know? Yes. Good. How much there is? How many bits can you store? That's actually not on the spec. Good you got that, even though it's a trick question, or it's a misleading spec. And this was 8 gigabytes. So certainly knowing how many bits you can store is one of the important properties about memory. What else do you care about? Yeah, so how long does it take you to read a bit? We talked about these delay lines where the time it takes to read a bit varies depending on which bit you're reading and when you're reading it. For DRAM, usually it's about the same time to read any bit, but it's not always exactly the same. The time it's going to take is fairly fuzzy from this. And part of the reason it's fuzzy from this is it's not exactly the same time, depending on what you're doing. The cycles here are 11 cycles. The cycle speed is not the same as the processor cycle speed. It's the cycle speed of this hardware. And that works out to about 13 nanoseconds, 13.75 nanoseconds, if it takes 11 cycles to read one particular row. 13 nanoseconds is, is pretty good. It's really not anything close to what it takes to read from a physical disk. Then we're talking millions of nanoseconds, but still slower than what it takes to read from the SRAM storage. We've got two entries in our table now. We've got the Mercury delay line that was used in many early computers, including UNIVAC. The time to access depends on which bit you're accessing, but the average time is orders of hundreds of thousands of nanoseconds. A nanosecond is a billionth of a second. A million nanoseconds would be a mill millisecond, so this is still to 10,000th of a second, which is really slow when you think about it in terms of 200,000 nanoseconds. And what we're targeting with modern DRAM is more like 14 nanoseconds. The other big difference is this cost. So the cost of the delay line, well, we don't actually know that. At least I couldn't find any good way to estimate that. And estimating cost over time is really hard because the value of money changes and there's inflation and things like this. But something like a bazillion nanodollars is a reasonable estimate. DRAM, it's about one nano dollar per bit. It's still pretty expensive. You're spending a billionth of a dollar for each bit that you can store in your DRAM. If we're going to store gigabytes of data, spending a billionth of a dollar per bit is OK. If we want to store terabytes, that's not OK. We need something cheaper. The other big problem with DRAM is it doesn't last. If you want to have a value be there the next time you come back to your computer, you've got to have the power on all the time which is not really that much of a drawback for lots of computers. They do have the power on all the time. But you're spending a lot of extra energy keeping all those values in place. And if you have a power outage, you lose everything. Or if it's a laptop and you run out of battery, you lose everything. So we need persistent storage, and we need cheaper storage. 